Hello everybody, my name is Shortline614 and welcome back to I think this is episode 9 of Shortline Surrounders and Comet and yes, I am back making these videos which is excellent and today's episode is going to be all about Montana Rail Lake and the various updates to the MRL acquisition which was actually the first story I ever covered so let's get right into it and the big story is of course the MRL deal is progressing the uh, Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, the union that represents 500 of MRL's uh, 1,100 employees, has signed a tentative agreement with BNSF, and BNSF has also submitted a formal patent, uh, petition to the Surface Transportation Board to reacquire MRL, and let's get right into it, shall we? So, our first story segment is Montana Rail Link, BNSF, and the union. So, despite BNSF being the epicenter of the current rail labor crisis with the high-vis policy that's currently coming to a head with Congress trying to stop it, uh, stop a potential strike. On September 6, 2022, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen signed a tentative agreement with BNSF. Uh, BLET represents 500 of MRL's 1,100 employees, and the, the uh, union members got to vote and the ballots were due on October 30th, and they voted overwhelmingly to ratify the agreement, which may sound weird to begin with, but once I read off the terms of, an, of the agreement, perhaps it will become a little bit more clear. The NSF also reached similar agreements with nine other unions, representing 962 out of MRL's 1,100 employees. And the agreement that was signed covers the hiring of MRL employees to BNSF, Seniority, work rules, pay, benefits, and the integration of MRL into the BNSF system. And the current agreement includes the following 12 provisions. The first one is that current MRL train yard and engine employees will be offered employment with BNSF. Number two, maintain original MRL hire date for prior seniority on the MRL subdivision. Three, maintain original MRL hire date for the accrual of vacation and personal leave days. Those last two basically mean that when uh, MRL employees hire on with BNSF, their their seniority, their record won't be just entirely wiped and they won't have to start over. Uh, number four, which is that employees will not be forced off the MRL subdivision. Number five, maintain current pool runs. Number six, maintain the reverse lodging option for pool crew employees. Number seven, maintain the 12, 24, 36 hour rest option for employees, which basically means that employees can choose when they get to rest. Uh, number eight, maintain two-hour call times between when the, the train yard and engine employees first get the call and when they have to show up. Uh, nine, which is the extra board, the engineer extra board will now have a rest cycle. Number 10, Montana Rail Link will offer a $5,000 bonus for hiring out with BNSF. Number 11, health and welfare coverage on day one with BNSF, including dental and vision. And 12, maintains a 401k program for employees on day one of their employment with BNSF. And I'm not particularly familiar with the current agreement Montana Rail Link has with uh, their employees and the unions. So if there are any current Montana Rail Link employees watching this, perhaps they can give us some more information and clear it up down in the comments section. I would, I would like that very much. And in my somewhat uneducated opinion, I will admit, uh, this looks very beneficial for Montana Rail Link employees. And hopefully BNSF will not be allowed to pull what they have pulled with their current train yard and engine employees, um, which uh, hopefully hopefully is good. Uh, and honestly, one of the more interesting aspects about this is, for me at least, is that it looks to me, and yet again, maybe someone can clarify who seems more familiar, it looks like BNSF simply agreed to whatever the unions demanded to help get the acquisition pushed through. This isn't uncommon. Uh, getting politically connected groups such as uh, unions or Amtrak uh, is pretty key to get a lot of big acquisitions pushed through, and we've seen that in the past few years with various merger and acquisition activity. Um, take a look at CSX Pan Am, for example, where despite CSX being actively engaged with a battle over passenger service with Amtrak on the Gulf Coast, Amtrak put out a list, I think it was around 12 demands, 12 um, that they wanted the STB to force upon the merger and CSX simply agreed to them all and that was because they don't want to they don't want to increase uh, the the opposition to whatever merger or acquisition they want to get pushed through so they simply basically agree to something that they wouldn't otherwise agree to and it's also 
very, very, uh, it basically allows a, like Amtrak or the unions to get something in return. So that's, that's possibly the most interesting aspect of the, of the union agreement for me. Um, so yes, and uh, let's, let's continue. The biggest segment of this episode, which is the Montana Rail Link application. So on November 18th, 2022, Montana Rail Link submitted a petition for exemption to the Surface Transportation Board to terminate its lease and give their railroad back to be. Quote, Montana Rail Link hereby petitions the Surface Transportation Board for an exemption from the prior review and approval provisions to discontinue common carrier service and to allow for the termination of an MRL lease over approximately 656.47 miles of mainline owned by BNSF and to discontinue MRL's bridge-only trackage rights over approximately 96.4 miles of line owned by BNSF. MRL has decided to terminate its existing lease, allowing BNSF to resume operations and maintenance along this corridor. MRL's operations are substantially dependent on its relationship with BNSF, as evident by the fact that more than 95% of the traffic moved by MRL over its lease lines are BNSF loads, with BNSF maintaining sole authority for determining rates and commercial terms. As a result, BNSF resuming operations and maintenance along this corridor will have minimal impact to MRL's rail-served customers. The lines leased by MRL are a critical link in BNSF's Northern Transcontinental Network, delivering grain, consumer, and industrial products to the West Coast. By terminating its lease with, M with BNSF, it, uh, BNSF will eliminate, the need, will eliminate the need to interchange freight between the two railroads, strengthening the resiliency of the supply chain and enhancing rail capacity in the Pacific Northwest. Customers across MRL's network will be able to maintain their service agreements and rates, providing continuity for Montana shippers to ensure that BNSF meets its commitment to current MRL served customers. BNSF and MRL have agreed that BNSF will offer employment to all union and non-union MRL employees in their current jobs with comparable pay, benefits, seniority rights, and other material terms of employment." Unquote. Hello everybody, Future Editing Shortline here, and turns out that a great portion of this next segment is outdated and wrong. Sometimes news moves faster than I can make videos, and uh, that was the case this time. And uh, the Surface Transportation Board uh, has accepted the petition for exemption, and there will be no full application process. And the, the, uh, the decision will be by March 8th, 2023. So... I apologize. I still wanted to put this next segment into the video because, well, I already had edited most of it. So just be aware that the commentary is very much outdated by now. Thank you. So I think the most interesting aspect of this is that Montana Rail Link is wanting this deal exempted from the formal, from a formal Surface Transportation Board approval process uh, because MRL states that this transaction is of limited scope due to the fact that the majority of Montana Rail Link's traffic is BNSF haulage rights traffic, and the main line is a leased, not outright owned. Of course, that is a true fact. 95% of the traffic along Montana Rail Link are those BNSF haulage rights trains, and that simple fact is the number one reason why Montana Rail Link is, going, is probably going to disappear as a regional railroad. There are only about 125 active shippers that are direct Montana Rail Link customers. I think most of those are kind of more smaller local customers rather than the national customers. Um, but I don't think that the Surface Transportation Board will allow this deal to simply be exempted and go through without any kind of proper review. In the past, whenever a Class 1 has tried to acquire a Class 2, it has always had to go through a full application process. Um, any of the deals that I can remember, BSX Pan Am, uh, CP, DM&E, uh, CN, EJ and e you know, even something relatively small like uh, when Canadian Pacific reacquired the Central Maine in Quebec. Those had to all go through a full application process. When CSX was trying to acquire Pan Am Railways a few years ago, and they tried to get it exempted, but they were told back, told to come back multiple times with a full and complete application. And I simply do not think that with a deal that is this large, yes, even though most of the traffic along these lines are BNSF haulage rights traffic, even though the line, the main line is Least and not actually outright owned by Montana Rail, like, I do not think it will change that fact. Let's continue. So, quote, The transaction will not and cannot subject shippers to market power abuse. No shipper will lose rail service or experience a reduction in the number of carriers with access to its facilities, 
Shippers on the leased premises are currently served by a single carrier, Montana Rail Link, and will continue to be served by a single carrier, BNSF, following the MRL lease discontinuance. Furthermore, MRL currently acts as a handling carrier for BNSF, and BNSF sets rates for nearly all traffic that originates or terminates on the leased premises. Over the last several years, more than 95% of the traffic traversing the leased premises has been operated on behalf of BNSF by MRL, over which MRL has no independent pricing authority. Quote. And of course, they're referring to those holodrite strains. And while it is technically true that no shipper will lose rail service since no lines are being abandoned or experience a reduction in the number of carriers with access to its facilities, this technical truth, and this is, as I said, this is where I'm getting into my opinion, uh, this, I believe that this has, this technical truth and, and a strict reliance to this technical truth has in many ways kind of ruined rail competition. For example, if you are a shipper on Railroad A that interchanges with Railroad B and Railroad C, you have two good routing options. But if Railroad A and Railroad B merge, well, you still technically have two routing options because typically most class ones keep open, even if they're directly competitive, they keep open those gateways with one another. But it becomes far, one basically one routing option becomes far easier and the other becomes far harder. This is something I've actually changed my opinion on in the past few months, which is a perfect example, which is CSX Pan Am. I was very supportive of that, and I'm still somewhat supportive because I think CSX honestly has the resources to go up there and fix Timothy Mellon's disaster railroad, and there hopefully is an increase in long-range competition between Port of St. John and, and the Midwest. But kind of looking back on it, if I were to look at it from a sort of idealist standpoint, like what would my ideal rail network look like? Honestly, I probably would have preferred Pan Am Railways becoming a CSX NS joint venture similar to, say, uh, the Winston-Salem Southbound or, or the New York Susquehanna and Western or Conrail Shared Assets. Um, New England is kind of a special case where there's only a limited number of lines in and out of there and there's no real way to split them. And there's also a lot of traffic that could potentially be subject to competition from uh, CSX and NS to and from Pan Am lines. So joint ownership would probably be best. However, of course, that merger and acquisition has gone through and, and the pragmatist part of me thinks that unless NS was willing to pony up the money, which they simply weren't, uh, something like that was never going to happen. But um, of course, and this is the point that you know I've, I've driven home a lot, of course, 95% of MRL's traffic is traffic where MRL has no independent pricing authority because the overwhelming amount of Montana Rail Link's traffic is this overhead haulage rights and not local Montana shippers. And I don't know if BNSF and MRL are doing this for certain, but based off of railroad history and how a lot of regional rail sales in the 80s and 90s went, there were conditions, uh, routing conditions and you know paper barriers and rate conditions that made it so that the railroad that sold the regional shippers along that regional could still only ship via that class one that was the only viable option and it could entirely be possible i'm not familiar enough I, I can't find any reference to it but i wouldn't be surprised maybe it's just because i haven't dug deep enough but i wouldn't be surprised if if there were conditions like this in place where it makes it so that customers on montana railway could only viably ship with through to bnsf and I also frankly think that BNSF and MRL are being a bit dishonest with this. The fact that the majority of shippers choose, or, or maybe in some cases their only viable option, a MRL-BNSF routing does not mean that no competition will be eliminated. An alternative routing does exist. Montana Rail Link interchanges with Union Pacific, for instance, at Sandpoint, Idaho. Uh, not at Spokane, there's a paper barrier against that. I think BNSF retained a bit, bit of trackage around Butte making sure that Montana Rail like, couldn't directly connect with Union Pacific there. So, does all this mean I personally now oppose this merger? I would still say no, because I still think it was a massive blunder that was more or less a knee-jerk anti-union reaction on behalf of BN in the 1980s. And I still think that BNSF and their shippers would benefit from having this corridor under the control of one company. If I were in charge of BNSF, this would be the probably one of the first things that I would do. Um, however, I think, you know, from a personal standpoint, I think that 
protections for local Montana shippers in the form of, say, keeping open gateways at fair rates or even bringing in a second railroad would be would be good. Um, my, I ever since the Milwaukee Road was uh, the Pacific Extension was banned in 1980, Montana has more or less been at a BNSF monopoly, BN BNSF monopoly, despite the existence of MRL. And I think it would be very nice and see an increase in competition to make the industry healthier if that northern tier of states, which in many ways, even though the Pacific Extension was uh, utter garbage, uh, hasn't really seen any viable competition in, in a really long time. Um, however, I, I think if this goes through uh, the full application process, which I Part of me wants the full application process to go through because when you do a full application process you have to submit a heck of a lot of information like train count, network improvements, stuff like that, and I kind of want to get my hands on that, but it's neither here nor there. But if this go does go through a full application process, you're going to have to have hearings. And I think there are going to be a heck of a lot of people from the state of Montana itself or local Montana shippers that will honestly give the STB an earful about BNSF and BN and how the, this monopoly has more or less treated them over the last 40 years. And I do think that the, the Surface Transportation Board will probably give an ear to that um, based off of the people in charge of the STB right now. Well, let's, let's continue. So, quote, in connection with this agreement, MRL has also agreed to grant BNSF trackage rights over certain branch lines owned by MRL. BNSF will obtain the necessary board authority for those trackage rights in a separate proceeding. Now, this... This may seem a bit confusing on the first of it, but you have to look at the physical structure of the of Montana Rail Link and how the deal was initially structured. Montana Rail Link leases the line, the main line, from BNSF directly. However, the branch lines are owned outright, and that goes back to kind of a weird legal technicality involving the Northern Pacific. The Northern Pacific's original charter basically stated that it couldn't construct branch lines. So when the Northern Pacific construct wanted to construct branch lines, they had kind of independent local uh, groups come in and construct the branch lines for them with NP funding and then NP would buy them. Kind of a weird agreement in retrospect, but that's the reason why. And um, the, uh, the branch lines are of course owned. So M Montana Rail Lake, and I covered this I think back in episode six, seven, where Montana Rail Link will continue to own the branch lines, but they will be operated under BNSF under a under a full trackage rights agreement. Um, not an overhead trackage rights agreement, just a full complete trackage rights agreement. And such an agreement will, it might have its own separate proceedings, it might be if this goes through a whole application process, it's likely that it might be lumped in to, um, into, uh, into the, uh, the full application. And I suspect MRL wants to keep ownership of the branch lines. Uh, mostly for profit reasons, uh, real estate mostly, or until they can sell them to another potential operator. Maybe that operator is BNSF, maybe it's someone different. Um, you know, BNSF does have a history of taking back branch lines that they have leased in the past, uh, beyond, of course, Montana Rail Link. Uh, one in the region was the Mission Mountain Railroad from Columbia Falls to Class Bell, Montana. That was a, a, I think, a former Northern Pacific branch operated by Watco, and BNSF took it back a few years ago. And uh, yes, uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, hopefully more of these will be coming out very soon. And uh, I will see you in the next one. Goodbye, everybody.